welcome to today's broadcast of North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of NIC television students and your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist Tony Stewart. Welcome to our program and our discussion today of Belgium resistance during World War II. In order to discuss this particular topic, we're happy to welcome to the program Al Vogel, who is a reporter with the St. Mary's Gazette record in St. Mary's, Idaho. Mr. Vogel's family uh, was involved in the Belgian resistance, and he's been most cooperative and to be with us today to discuss this important topic. And Al, we wish to welcome you to the program. Thank you. And I'm happy, as always, to have regular members of our panel with us to discuss this topic today. Uh, first of all is Janelle Burke, who is an attorney in the state of Idaho. And next to her is Steve Schink, who is Dean of College Relations and Development North Idaho College. And we shall ask Janelle Burt to commence the questioning. Mr. Vogel, you have a very personal interest in this topic that you're going to be talking about today. Please share with us some of your background, uh, that is, how your family came to be involved in this resistance. Well, actually, it was only my mother that was involved in her first husband, Pierre de Prater. Um, she is a she was a Belgian national. She's been dead now six years, but um, early in the war, her husband, who was a school teacher, was a lieutenant in the Belgian army. He was captured, put in a POW camp for about six months, repatriated back to the country as a school teacher, and formed his own resistance group. And uh, of course, my mother, being married to him, was active in the group as well. He was uh, captured by the Germans. Later on, about 1944, uh, tortured, taken up to, I believe it was Dusseldorf, and he was shot there. At the time that your mother was involved, did she have children? No. So they were a relatively young couple and felt strongly, I would take it, about the politics and what was going on at that particular time and became involved in this movement. I don't know that it was so much an involvement in politics. Uh, when you have armed guards on every corner and your friends are being hauled off in the middle of the night, politics kind of takes an aside almost. It's whatever your belief is, you're still a national, you're still a patriot. And when you're occupied like that, whether you're a communist or uh, conservative, you are still going to do the best to get rid of the invader. It must have been very frightening to be a part of this. Was mm -hmm. it scary? Does your, did your mother relate that it was a, a very frightening kind of experience to be a part of the resistance movement? How difficult was it to get a group together to begin to resist? Well, the resistance movement in Belgium and throughout Europe, people don't realize when you talk of, say, French resistance, people are under the impression that there were thousands under one network. Most resistance units were 15 to 20 people and were unaware that there was another unit over the hill. They had to be that way. If you had one man in command of thousands of people and if he were captured, he could spill the beans on thousands of lives. So the groups were very small. They were self-supporting. They got occasional help from British or, or American airdrops and things like that. But on the whole, they were small. As far as it being scary, I remember asking her one time, how did you get into it? And she said, well, you just find yourself in it. They say, uh, someone will, a friend of yours will say, take this message down to Jules, the baker, on the corner. And maybe that's your first uh, activity in the resistance. So you take the message down there. You walk two blocks down and give it to them. A little while later said, uh, they say, you know, Francois, the gardener, needs this box of shells. So you slip it in your purse and you give them to Francois the gardener. And it gradually builds up to where you're taking more and more, more of an active part in the resistance. Steve Sheen. Al, uh, apparently you have been spending some time now actively researching uh, your mother's participation in the, in the Belgian resistance during World War II. How did that start and how long ago uh, did you become interested in that work? Well, I've always been interested in her exploits, but just from a, a personal nature, her and her husband's exploits. Uh, I still have relatives over in Brussels that uh, were active in the resistance. I have never been to Europe. I've never been to Brussels, so uh, I have to get over there 
um, set a schedule for within two and a half years to interview them. But actually, I've only been researching her activities for about the past four or five months. Uh, the first thing I did was I photocopied a lot of the material and sent it to Simon Wiesenthal, whom they call the Nazi hunter in Austria. And uh, there were some secret messages that I have that were passed to her by her husband. And since they're in French and I don't speak French, I sent it to him thinking there might be some important information in that. He said that so much of it was in code or personal that it wasn't of much value to them, but they did appreciate my effort. Tell us a little bit about your research methodology at this point. What, uh, what avenues are you pursuing as you, re as you research this interest? I've been interviewing my father a bit just to see if he remembers anything that mom might have said along the way. Uh, my relatives, I have a lot of relatives in Tacoma that she was close with, picking up little anecdotes and tidbits that way. I've sent a uh, letter to the CIA. The forerunner of the CIA was the OSS, Office of Special Services, or Strategic Services, actually. And they, I know, dealt with a large number of resistance units during the war and supplying them. Um, I've sent letters to British MI5, military intelligence, thinking that in their old documents they might have some reference to the, the name of uh, Pierre de Prater's group was the Luke Mac, and I've been looking. It's just kind of a random tripwire approach. Just send out to anybody and do you have anything on the Luke Mac and Belgian resistance units and Sylvia de Prater and Pierre de Prater. And uh, as of yet, I haven't received anything back. I think they're probably still looking through their files. Do you have a goal in mind, or is this uh, is is there a book in this somewhere in your future, or, oh, or is yes. it just personal interest that? No, it's there's a book in mind. Um, the thing that I think spurred it on is I got to thinking one night about my mother died of cancer. She spent the last six or seven months bedridden, and while she was laying in bed on the news. There was a great deal about the Reverend Richard Butler and the Airhead Nations or whatever you want to call them. But there was a great deal on the news and I got to thinking that here's a former resistance fighter that's bedridden and has cancer and a social cancer is starting all over again. It's like people are forgetting. And I thought that's a tremendous link right there. I would like to start the book at that point with what I remember to be her last words to me, her last conversation before she lapsed into a coma. And she died at home, but um, parallel that along with the, the growth of the Aryan nations and, and then go back and look at her activities and her husband's and her whole family's. In dealing with this issue, the issue <clears throat> it requires an awful lot of information to get that in place for a book. Are you optimistic that uh, those agencies will cooperate, or, or how long do they keep such information uh, classified? Uh, have, you, have you had any indications yet that, that they will uh, assist you in that? I don't. I haven't received any reply from them, but then I only sent the letters off here about a month, five weeks ago, um, because it took me almost that long to find out the name of the resistance group and some of their activities so that I would be able to send them enough information where they might be able to find something. But um, I don't foresee that there would be anything classified. We know that her first husband, Pierre, was smuggled out of Belgium on at least two occasions into England for further training and then voluntarily went back into Belgium, which I think says a lot for his character because if it had been me once I got out of Nazi occupied Belgium that would have been it. Uh, but the commitment I, was very great wasn't it? It was and well like I said we know that he was well trained and that they were active in uh, smuggling down British airmen out of the country. As you're doing your research you, I'm sure you're trying to identify other members of this particular group of resistance. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it was, as you indicated, a small group. Have you yet discovered where any other members of the group are still alive and that you'll have an opportunity to, 
talk with them personally because I would think there's where you would have a wealth of information. I haven't identified any other members. Um, I, well, I have, but they're they're dead. One was a uh, member of the Belgian royalty, or she was a contessa, or something like that, along the lines. I can't think of her name offhand. Um, there was another that uh, died shortly after the war. Um, I haven't found anybody. There are members of my mother's family, cousins, that were active in other resistance groups that would have a lot of insight as to how they operated, what they did. You've brought some information with you that uh, I think our viewers would be very interested in, and I'm going to uh, try to show some of this to our viewers, and if you would assist me with it, I, I, I think that uh, okay. some of the documentation you have is very interesting. We'll start on, on the personal level, and I have here a photograph of uh, I believe this is the funeral of your mother's first husband, Pierre mm -hmm. de Preter. Uh, and this, in other words, after his death, he was brought back to Belgium and, and, the, and the funeral took place there? Yeah, he was shot in uh, Stuttgart. He was taken to a prison in Stuttgart. He was shot there. And uh, I don't understand why, because the uh, Germans at that time were not the most amenable people, but for some reason, they did ship his body back to Brussels. And there was a funeral for him there. And I show that. Here's another photograph. Uh, I believe he is the, uh, the sec second, second the person line. here, what I'm pointing to right here. If we can get that on the camera, why? Uh, it's this gentleman right here that I'm pointing to. Uh, and these are some other soldiers that were in the Belgium service. Yes, he was a lieutenant in the Belgian army. Mm -hmm. I think well, also very interesting are documents that, uh, it's, that families do preserve. And, I have a number here, and one of them is, uh, if you'll explain this to us, I, I have first this uh, certificate is awarded to Pierre uh, de Preter as a token of gratitude for and appreciation of the help given to the sailors, soldiers, and airmen of the British Commonwealth of Nations, which enabled them to escape from or evade capture by the enemy, and this is signed by the Air Chief Marshal, uh, which is an uh, interesting document. Could you explain this in a little more detail? I don't know about much more than what is on there. I do know that they were active in smuggling downed airmen out of the country. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, it was British airmen. I've found some addresses of uh, British soldiers, their names and unit numbers, that I suspect may have been some of them that they were smuggled out. Mm -hmm. And then I also believe he uh, won, uh, obviously, a number of other uh, honors, but uh, one of them, I believe, is the equivalent to the highest honor in this country. Would you like to explain this particular document? Yes. Uh, Pierre was posthumously awarded uh, the Order of Leopold with palm leaf and cluster, which is the equivalent of our Medal of Honor. Mm -hmm. And he was promoted to uh, major posthumously. His grave is uh, a shrine over there in Brussels now. Um, generally in Europe, or at least in Brussels that I know of, uh, that I've been told, when you die about eight years later, they come back and dig you up and dispose of what's left, because usually there isn't much left. And they recycle grave sites. Pierre's is, has never been recycled. They've turned it into a memorial to him, and it will never be dug up. You also brought with you, you mentioned earlier on this program, that when your mother went to visit her husband in prison, that uh, he would write messages on, this is a little strip of cloth, and it's got a message on both sides, uh, as one can note here. And uh, I believe he put this under his collar. And mm -hmm. would you explain to us how he got this to your mother and got it out of prison? Well, when he was in uh, Bredonk, which has been a prison in Brussels for 300 years or more, uh, possibly even longer than that. I, I know at least 300. But anyway, when he was a prisoner in Brussels, and Bredonk was uh, a torture prison for the Germans. She would visit him there on occasion, and he wrote messages on this cloth, which he would slip under his collar. And uh, I guess at first opportunity, he would pull it out, and she would slip it under her collar, and later on walk out with it. Uh, I don't speak French or read it. I've had some of it translated. I do have a friend of my mother's in Tacoma that's uh, Belgian. She has translated part of it, but, uh, and she was 
a young girl during the wartime, her biggest difficulty in translating it is that she breaks down because it is, you know, it still strikes home with her after 40 years. You also brought with you a, a dress, a, 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 or a blouse, excuse me, I guess it's a blouse that we mm -hmm. can get this, and this is something your mother made, and uh, would you explain to us the significance of this blouse? That blouse is made out of a British parachute. Uh, I suspect it was a parachute from one of the downed flyers that they helped to smuggle out of the country. Um, uh, she said that material was extremely difficult to get hold of during the war, except for lace. Belgium is known for its lace, mm -hmm. and that's why there's so much lace on it, but the material itself is parachute material. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Janelle Burke. Let's talk a little bit about the life of the resistance fighter. What kind of thing happened on a daily basis? I assume that they had a job that they regularly went to, a cover, in other words that they would normally go to every day. But did, how were they working behind the scenes? Well, they didn't have uh, regular meetings. And a lot of times, from what my mother told me, that they didn't know that there was anything to be done until hours before. And what kinds of things would they do? Take messages, harbor take, people? Take messages, hide people, um, sabotage. And sabotage can actually be uh, a very simple thing. She said that, uh, as an example, during the war, the Germans were meticulous about their uniforms. If you were found to have a dirty uniform, you were sent to the Russian front. And no German wanted to go to the Russian front. When the blackout at night came, there were cafes that the German officers would get drunk in. They would go out at night and pull the manhole covers off the sewers outside the cafe. So these pitch blackness, these drunken officers come stumbling out and fall down into the sewers of Brussels and have to float a quarter mile before they could get out again at the next manhole cover and then have to make it all the way back to their camp without being caught with a dirty uniform. And she used to laugh about that. that uh, she said, we sent a lot of German officers to the front that way. And that's just a simple sabotage. It's effective, it's simple, and people tend to think of sabotage as uh, sticks of dynamite and all of that, which I'm sure she was involved in. I haven't uncovered any tangible evidence, but then I'm sure they didn't keep notes on what was done either. When they were hiding someone, how long did they hide them, and where, where would they have found a place to hide them? Was it under the bed, or, or was it in the cellar, or what kinds of places might they have been likely to have put someone? I understand that there was a Catholic church nearby, and they used to hide airmen in the basement of it. She didn't see her husband while he was fleeing from the Germans for about two and a half years during the war. And one of the priests there, made arrangements for her and her husband to meet each other for 10 minutes in this church out of two and a half years. Um, but I know that this particular uh, uh, priest that ran the church was sympathetic to the resistance. But she said, "You, I remember her telling me that you just hid people wherever you could, in barns and trunks of cars. and." You kept them moving all the time. They never stayed more than two or three days at a place. And they had well-arranged uh, places to hide people. Would this have been sort of a railroad effect where it was coming from mm -hmm. the east and going west, I take it back to, to uh, Great Britain, uh, back to England? Probably. So it would have been a sort of railroad effect, or was it someone that they found who had just been shot down? It would have been more of a railroad effect. The Germans were very good at recovering downed pilots. And uh, they had so many patrols out. And of course, you've got to use your parachute to get down. And that's a big marker up there in the sky anyway. But uh, they let it be known to uh, the British that they had the means of hiding these people. And of course, the British would take every opportunity, or the Allies, I should say. But uh, as far as where they were smuggled to and, and ultimately how they got back to England, I don't know. I suspect by submarine, possibly even uh, airplanes landing at night. Now I want to switch 
completely to another subject and ask you, what did it mean then to be an American to your mother? Or did she become a U.S. citizen? And uh, what, what did it mean to live in this country to her after she had had these experiences in Belgium and apparently had a very strong national feeling there? Well, the, the Belgians are very nationalistic people. Uh, I've had a lot of relatives come over here to visit. Uh, they love America. My mother and father and my brother have been over there and said you cannot buy a, bu cannot buy a beer in the pub or anything once they find out you're American. Um, they go out of their way for the Americans because the Americans saved them in World War I and in World War II and they feel the same way about the British. Um, they are not great fans of the French, however. But um, now, after the death of, of Pierre, then your mother met your father. Is mm -hmm. that correct? And and was he an American soldier there at that time? Yes, he was an engineer, or he was an engineering unit uh, during the war. He met her in Brussels at a dance. She could not speak English. He couldn't speak French or Flemish. She spoke Flemish actually, and. Uh, uh, one of these days I have to ask my father, how did you ever communicate? <laughs> how did you even ask her to dance? It must have been a lot of sign language going on. And he was only there in Brussels for about two and a half, three weeks before he uh, moved out and for the final conquering of Germany. And he came back here in 45 and saved up money and sent her the ticket to uh, come over on a boat in 47. He drove all the way back from Tacoma from Tacoma to New York to meet her at the boat. And, and what did it mean to her then to become a person who lives in this country where there's so much freedom? Oh, she thought the world of this country. She really did. There were a lot of things she didn't understand, a lot of inequities, especially during the uh, Vietnam War with uh, draft deferments for college, people that were in college. She thought that if you were going to draft anybody, everybody should get it equally across the board and she was very much against any kind of deferments except on physical grounds. Um, but in later years she said that coming to this country, she said a number of times, was the best thing that ever happened to her. Steve Sheen. Al, as a reporter it must be very frustrating for you to have had the perfect source for your, for your research in your mother six years ago and not to have begun the project until after she died. Mm -hmm. Um, did she ever, in any of the conversations that you remember, and it wouldn't, they wouldn't have been structured at that point, but did she ever talk about how it was that she escaped? Um, I can see that early uh, the Germans probably hoped that she would lead them uh, to her first husband. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, um, it, it must have been a, a pretty risky thing for her. They could have, uh, clearly they knew she was a, symp a sympathizer. They could have arrested her too, couldn't they? They did arrest her on two separate occasions. She was jailed once I think for six months and another for four months. Did she feel lucky to get away with her life? I think she felt very lucky. She was in, uh, I can't think of the name of the prison, but she was in the same cell that uh, Edith Cavell was in. Edith Cavell was a British nurse in World War I who was a British spy and she was eventually shot by the Germans for her spying activities and my mother was in the same cell as Edith. and. Uh, I remember it was a rather heartfelt moment for her. There's a Mount Edith Cavell in British Columbia with an overview of it that we went up there in about 1967 and it was very hard for her. You mentioned that, uh, that Belgians to this day haven't forgotten a, a sense of appreciation for Americans or for the British. How do they feel about the Germans? They still hate the Germans. <laughs> I have a uh, cousin, Francois, when he was 16 or 17 years old, he worked for another resistance group. Um, he acted as a poor, dumb kid and got a job on a German airfield loading 55-gallon oil drums. And he acted like a dummy and uh, all the German soldiers took him under his wing and gave him chocolate and he acted like he wasn't quite all there. And actually what he was doing is he was counting oil drums onto the back of the trucks and he was noting which planes were coming in and which German officers were around the area and which outfits and every night he was radioing his information to Britain at 16, 17 years old. And, uh, but to this day he has a friend in Czechoslovakia 
or is it Yugoslavia, one of the two? But anyway, he has to drive across Austria. He will stop before the Austrian border and fill up his car, and he won't buy anything in Austria. It's a straight trip. My mother was laughing about it. She says, if you have to go to the bathroom in Austria, you're not going. Francois will keep driving. He won't stop for anything in that country. He won't buy a nickel's worth of anything. Has it occurred to you that th there may be a, a, as good or even better a market for your book when it's finally completed in Belgium as there is in the United States? I don't think so much in Belgium because from what I can gather there were literally everybody was involved in some form of resistance. So I would think that there wouldn't be any big, big deal to them. I know that it's, it's, there are moments for you that are, that are very personal and, and emotional as you deal with this uh, particular book, but that may be its greatest strength, uh, to be able in a very personal way. I'm not trying to get you to reveal in advance what all the book's going to be, but do you intend to make it somewhat of a very a personal history of, of, of what it did to your mother and, and her husband, and uh, then also talk about uh, what happens to a people or to a family uh, when there is this kind of dictatorial movement in the country? Oh, very much so. My mother, uh, of course, I'm prejudiced in this regard, but she was one of the kindest people I knew. She was a great animal lover. Uh, when I started going hunting when I was 16, she tried to talk me out of it. She wouldn't hurt anything. Um, and contrasted with her activities in the resistance that I know she was in on some activities that resulted in the deaths of Germans. And I think the gist of the book will be no one knows what they're capable of until they actually have to do it. I wish we could continue this program. You have been so informative and we appreciate your bringing uh, some of your family's personal documents. Uh, it's been, it has been a personal story and we look forward to the book and because we think it would be helpful to so many other people and it is also keeping history alive so history does not repeat itself. And again, on behalf of the panel and the staff, we thank you for taking time uh, to come to our city and to do this interview with us. Well, thank you. It's been a very good pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest has been Al Vogel, who is a reporter with the St. Mary's Gazette Record in St. Mary's, Idaho. But he's been with us today to discuss the Belgian resistance in World War II and the impact that had upon his mother uh, and his research today and what that was all about. We hope you've enjoyed our program and that it's been informative to you. And we would invite you to be with us again next week at the same time when we will discuss what we believe is an important subject. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. North Idaho College Public Forum can be seen at the same time each week over this station. This production was videotaped earlier by an NIC student crew for viewing at this more appropriate time.